Hi everybody, welcome to the second lesson in week seven of biopsychology. In this session, we're going to focus on split brain research. So we'll provide an overview of the research that's been done into hemispheric lateralization, a close look at the research results and conclusions, and we'll go through once again, lateralization of brain function. So let's see what you know already. Pause the video for five minutes while you write down, and if you don't know, that's absolutely fine. This is a specialist term, so you may want to look on the internet. But what is a commissurotomy? So this is a type of surgery that some patients with very severe epilepsy may undergo to have their corpus callosum removed. So the part of the brain that connects the left and right hemisphere of the brain might have to intentionally be severed as part of their recovery. Now, research into hemispheric lateralization of the brain often uses split brain patients, and that's another specialist term for you to make a note of. Now, these are people who've had the corpus callosum removed as part of that medical treatment we've just mentioned. There are also people who've got pre-existing conditions such as epilepsy, and they've no communication as a result of the surgery between the left and right side of the brain. Now, the key thing here is that hopefully this is just temporary. The idea of the surgery is to sever the communication so that eventually the brain is able to knit itself back together. And once again, the left and right side of the brain will be able to communicate, but without the episodes of epilepsy. Now, thinking about split brain patients, what strengths and limitations can you think of about using them in research that aims to understand our brain better? So based on what we've just said, pause the video for five minutes and see if you can use your knowledge of psychology, split brain patients, and everything else you've been studying so far on biopsychology to highlight some strengths and limitations. Here's a couple that you could have used. So you can appreciate that there may not be many people available to study. So we've got an issue with population validity straight away. In addition to this, they tend to be a specialized sample. Not only do they have specific pre-existing conditions, but they also now have undergone a very specialist surgery. So what we've got is questions about whether this sample can really represent the way typical brains communicate. Now, you may see this later on as a benefit or a limitation, but an ideographic approach has been taken to study split brain patients, focusing on their experience, focusing on how they communicate, how their brain operates. So it's a very much interested in the individual, rather than generating general rules. And this is the start of our introduction of issues and debates in this topic. Now for hemispheric lateralization of the brain, you've got to be aware of split brain research. So we're gonna take a slow, close look at one of the more complex studies on your specification. And this was conducted by Sperry in 1967. The aim of the study was to investigate whether the two hemispheres of the brain are specialised in certain functions. So he did want to find out whether it is likely the different sides of the brain are attributed to different skills. We know already that we're going to use split brain patients who've had the surgery due to their epilepsy. And the method used by Sperry to conduct the study is lab experiments. Multiple tasks given to the participants, but in a controlled environment. The method undertaken by Sperry included a special apparatus that was created for the purpose of this study. And this apparatus was to enable the control of visual input. So in the study, you'll find that the participants were shown information to their left or right visual field. And since we know that the visual field is complex, they needed a way to ensure that it was only presented in the left or right visual field. And that's what this apparatus was for. 
Objects were presented quickly, so there wasn't enough time for eye movement. And in this particular method, there was lots of different stages. So first of all, participants were asked to describe what they could see in front of them, just like you can see in the diagram on the screen. Now here we go with some results first of all. If the object was in their left visual field, and we know already that this is made in its process by the right hemisphere, then they were unable to see it. But if the object was in their right visual field, they could describe it. So we need to have a think about what this means. When the information was in the left visual field, they couldn't do it. So that's telling us that the right hand side of the brain, the right hemisphere, might not be for our description skills. Because if it was, then the information in the left visual field would manage to reach the right side of the brain and we would be able to do what we've been asked to, which is to describe what they could see. So why do you think the only time participants were successful at describing what they could see was when it was presented to their right visual field. Now we've gone over this briefly, but the harder part is actually writing this down. So pause the video for five minutes while you write a suggested answer down to this question and do make sure that you don't become muddled when talking about left and right visual fields and left and right hemispheres of the brain. Here's two crucial things that you would need to include in your answer. Firstly, the right visual field is processed by the left hemisphere of the brain. And the left hemisphere is where the language centers are. So this tells us that the left hemisphere of the brain may be attributed to the language skills. After all, if they're presented in the right visual field, and we can complete the job of describing what we see, then this means that the left hemisphere of the brain has been in use, and therefore we can conclude that language is lateralized to the left. Now, in a different part of the study, participants were asked to draw what they could see, just like we've got in the diagram on the screen. If the object was in their left visual field, and remember, this is processed by the right hemisphere, they were able to draw it well. And it's worth mentioning that all the participants were right-handed, so that was eliminated as a, an extraneous variable. Now, if the object was in their right visual field, meaning it was processed by the left hemisphere, they struggled to draw it well. So to go over that again, if they were asked to draw something that they could see in their left visual field, they did it well. But if they were asked to draw something and presented it in their right visual field, they didn't do too well. So why do the results of the drawing task suggest that the right hemisphere is dominant for visual motor tasks? Pause the video for another five minutes while you write your answer down and again, don't become muddled by some of the specialist terms that you will need to use to make sure your answer is relating specifically to lateralization. Here's some of the things you definitely need to include. So make a note if you didn't get them yourself. Well, participants could only draw an object successfully if it was in their left visual field and drawn with the left hand. So what we already know is that both of those things, the visual field and the left hand, would be using the right hemisphere of the brain. So since the right hemisphere of the brain was processing the information and they could successfully draw, this shows the right hemisphere must control visual motor tasks. 